Hello everyone. Welcome to 2020 Women's Lunch Panel. My name is Prakriti. I work as a senior machine learning engineer at LinkedIn and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm very excited to have you all join us virtually. Our panel today includes a roster of women scientists and leaders who each bring to the table their unique experiences and journeys. And they are women working on some of the most challenging problems we are facing today. A quick note on the format. In the first half of the discussion, we'll learn more about their professional journeys, their career philosophy, and what drove some of the key decisions they have taken along the way. And in the second half, we'll talk a little bit about the technical and policy challenges they are facing in some of the contemporary issues specifically related to the pandemic. Uh, we'll use the first question as an introductory one where we'll hear from all the panelists and for subsequent questions, it will be more of a conversation between a subset of the panel. At the very end, we'll also have some time for audience Q&A. So uh, I'll begin by requesting our panelists to introduce themselves and to keep the introduction even more interesting. Could you talk a little bit about your early childhood experiences? Were you able to predict such a career path? And what were some of your early influences? Um, so how about we start with Elaine? Hi, so my name is Elaine and so you see. Um, so childhood experiences. I loved math and biology, but I also loved the art. So I had this plan that I was going to be a scientist by day and an artist by night. Um, I haven't yet accomplished that, uh, but I definitely didn't predict that I was going to be a competition epidemiologist or that I will be studying diseases today, but I'm very happy to be where I am. Um. Next, do you, Karen, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Karen. I'm chief economist at LinkedIn. Um, so growing up, I actually planned to be a veterinarian, uh, but found that I did not like organic chemistry. So I switched my focus to economics. Um, so I'm just someone who's always interested in the question of how individuals relate to their broader community. I'm Black, I'm female, I'm American. And I saw the social and legal and you know, economic barriers that my family faced. Um, and so that was just something that drew me to economics. Um, maybe the quickest story I could tell you is just that when I went to, um, to a new high school at the age of 15, I went from a girl's school to a co-ed school. And at the co-ed school, they put me in the top math class. And I was shocked because there were no other girls in the class. And I, I was like, where are the girls? And it worked out that the girls that had started in the co-ed school didn't see themselves as adept at math. And it sort of stuck with me that I had been done a great service to go to this all girls school uh, for so many years. Um, and that realizing I thought girls could do anything. So that's kind of what set me on my path. Um, who wants to go next? Subarna, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Shubarna Sinha. So I grew up in India and to kind of talk about early influences, actually early on, I didn't particularly care for math or science. And I was more interested in literature, kind of the arts basically, right? Reading, writing, uh, literature, poetry, etc. But I think my father, who was, in, um, who was a professor in, of engineering, probably had other plans. So he started kind of bringing home books about science and I think physics, uh, where, they, where they explain the concepts very differently with, you know, with pictures and like at a, at a higher level rather than just a bunch of equations. And since I, since I was already an avid reader, I just started picking up those books and reading them. So that's sort of my early uh, kind of interest in science. And uh, I think in terms of a defining moment, one of the ones that I remember was in middle school, we had a math teacher who used to basically kind of write out a hard problem on the board and the whole class would try to solve it. And in one of the cases, I was actually able to solve a problem and suddenly everybody's perception of me changed. Suddenly I was a good, good in math kid basically. And so what happened is, you know, like I started investing more in that, the more I invested, the better I got basically. And ultimately I ended up, ended up with an engineering degree from IIT in India and then masters and PhD at UC Berkeley. And 
I've basically been in research positions at industry and academia ever since. Um, yeah, so that's me. Um, Vanessa? Um, so, yeah, so I have kind of the opposite experience of, of many of the people on the panel, which is that I was on the math avoidance plan for my entire childhood and teenage years and most of my 20s. And uh, my my plan from about the age of 12 was to, to, to be a pianist, which I did. I was a pianist, for, a professional pianist for 10 years. Um, and I guess the only thing that was a predictor that, that this would at all work out um, because it was a big risk when I changed careers, was that when I, from the age of about six, I had a sort of hyper-focus. When I'm, when I'm focused, I'm hyper-focused. So even at age six, I was able to practice the piano for an hour or two at a time. And, um, you know, by the age of, of 15, I was able to practice piano for six or seven hours a day. And so that, that ability to really focus on one thing once I'm engaged in it uh, was the only thing that was any clue that, that maybe this would work out. And when I when I went back to school, I was I was worried about the math because I said I'd been on the math avoidance plan, and at, you know at that point I was grown and I had a had a two year old son and I needed to um, I, I didn't want to pay I was trying to get a day job so I wanted to get through the program as quickly as possible so I didn't want to pay for extra math classes so I just took one of the pamphlets home for the for the placement test and I just learned everything in that pamphlet so that I could pass that test so that I didn't have to pay the tuition for those classes. And that was the first moment that I realized that, that it, you know, math is just, it's fairly straightforward if you just apply yourself, that it's not, uh, it's not a mysterious thing. So that was it. Yeah. Calandra? Um, yeah, so um, I'm Calandra Tate-Moore and I was thinking about, you know, for me, I grew up in a very small rural town in the South and um, for the longest, I guess, that I can remember, you know, I was thought to be a good student. So I think that kind of set the expectation that, hey, I could do something at some level of success. And I think it's only in hindsight that I remember just what that was and how limited, you know, it was in terms of the view. And so, like, for example, I had already taken by my junior year all of the math that was available in my high school. And in order to be able to take math my senior year, I would have had to go to another area, which at the time just wasn't feasible um, for my family. And I always joke that, you know, the town that I grew up in, if you could like spell smart, then people would say, you should be a doctor. And so I actually applied to college at, um, at the time. And even now, um, it's a school in the United States that is known for getting the most African-Americans in the med school. So Xavier University, that's where I went for undergrad. But my first semester when I got this whole list of science classes, I realized, although I always liked math and science, it was more of the math and numbers and not the science that I liked. And so very early on, I changed my major, I guess, to mathematics, still not really knowing what I could do with a math degree. I definitely could have, couldn't have said I want to be a data scientist that I am now because it didn't, like the language and the role just didn't exist at the time. But very early on, you know, I was told about the few amount of African American women with PhDs in mathematics. And so I knew that I wanted to go get math and at a higher level. So I ended up getting a fellowship through the Department of Defense to get a PhD in math. And so that started um, my government career. And so for most of my career, I've been um, in either academia or um, government research labs. Currently, I'm working for a government organization in a large um, research. Um, environment where I'm the valuation lead um, for their human language technology research. Sihem? Yes, hi. So I'm Sihem and I'm speaking to you from the south of France, which is right across the sea from where I grew up. And I grew up in Algiers, in Algeria, which is in Africa, which sort of qualifies me as an African American. Uh, and um, I um, one of the things that, uh, I guess a defining moment very early on was that I had to make a decision between a major in math and a major in ballet. And because I grew up in a Muslim country where doing ballet was not so valued, I ended up going into math. And it turns out, you know, I really loved math. And uh, that led me to France. I got a fellowship to, go to come to France where I did my master's and PhD. And then the next step was to go to America, obviously. <laughs> so I, um, I went to uh, AT&T labs in, uh, in the US and then uh, Yahoo labs in the US. 
And uh, because every place was home, uh, I then moved to Barcelona and then moved to Qatar. And today I'm, uh, I'm in France. I work as a research director in uh, Grenoble, which is a small town in the Alps. Um, so what really um, kind of carved my choices and I think part of my career is uh, people I met uh, along the way. I mean, people who were encouraging and people who d said things that were not so encouraging, but it turns out there were things that really did contribute to my career decisions. Uh, so one defining moment was when I was told by a male colleague, um, so you're making all these efforts and you know all this noise around you and doing this and that and doing all this work. So you, you, you wanna be me. And really, in, you know, deep inside myself, I was thinking, you know, you, you think I want to be you, really? Like, and uh, another moment that was also quite important in my choices and my career was another male colleague who um, really trusted me and you know, told me something that I wasn't expecting. He said, I believe you're the best person to, to do this. And um, somehow, in, Again, deep inside myself, I was thinking, you know, why is he thinking of me? So I think, you know, career choices and life paths are uh, very much, you know, uh, uh, defined and carved by uh, people who say things. And uh, it's up to you to turn those things into potential and turn things in, those things into uh, choices that you're making in your life. It's very inspiring to hear all your stories. Um, speaking of early uh, influences again, so many of the members of our audience are young career professionals like me, and we are often faced with self-doubts with questions such as, am I on the right path? Am I solving meaningful problems, creating impact to the best of my abilities and so on? And trying to balance the pursuit of these questions with personal commitments is often hard and uh, conflicting with trade-offs. So so how do you think about balancing these trade-offs in your own career and think about these questions? Um, I can speak to it a little bit. Um, I mean, I think balancing uh, anything with work is hard. Um, so I'm a wife and a mother of two kids, a 12-year-old boy and a nine-year-old daughter. Um, and I think the only thing that has worked for me really is to be explicit about how much work means to me, how central it is to my identity, and ask for help. Uh, like a little bit of what CM was saying, right? You're influenced by the people that meet you, but you also have to influence the people around you to kind of see, see what is important to you, right? Uh, and so I, you know, whether it's my husband or friends or my, my family or even my kids, I ask for help when I need it. Um, so just like a funny example is when my son was in first grade, uh, one day he came and told me that, mom, I really need you to quit work. And I'm like, why? And his response was, oh, because, you know, all my friends' mom stay at home and they get hot lunches. They get fresh lunches at lunchtime and you're packing this horrible sandwich for me every morning. And... Um, I was like, you know, obviously I was not going to quit because my son wanted hot lunches, but I was, you know, trying to think about how could I influence him. And so finally I started little by little talking to him about the work I do and, you know, like what's the value of that work and, and all of that and all the effort that I had put in to get there. And so now at 12, I, he is like the most feminist kid that I've ever met. He is super proud of the work I do. He cannot imagine me like leaving work ever. And uh, yeah, so I think, you know, my advice would be ask for help. Even sometimes the most well-meaning people may not realize how much effort it is to balance work with other things. And um, usually if you're surrounded by people that love you, they'll step up basically. That's my, I guess I want, I was gonna say something, um, I guess along of the, idea of like self-doubt and like questioning yourself you know people are quick to say well just don't do it or don't worry about it and you know regardless of how well-meaning that is you know I just want to be able to 
acknowledge and just say, you know, that I've realized from personal experience that it exists. And there are many reasons why, you know, especially as women, you know, that we'll have like these seeds of self-doubt. But um, I, I guess from, from my perspective, the longer that I'm around or like the further that I go, I realize one, that um, more people than I realize have self-doubt too. So usually it comes from us comparing ourselves to some notion of other people and what they are doing. Um, and I feel like just as many people have it. Or also this idea of the, um, like the man behind the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz, like reference. Like sometimes we have these grandiose ideas of, you know, we beat ourselves up of what is good enough or what is rigorous enough or, you know, how does this qualify? And so sometimes, you know, this thing that we, I guess, envision like unnecessarily, I know for me, it sort of um, does a disservice to the productivity because you're too busy worried about, well, is this gonna be good enough? And then, so you don't even get it um, completed, not knowing that this person that you're completing yourself, if you pull the curtains back, then they're just like you and trying to make everything work, you know, behind this curtain. So um, the balance question, I think when somebody else figures it out, they can let me know, because any semblance that I thought I had before what we're going through now, it's just like, now I'm like grasping at straws. I also have um, young kids and, um, and this whole idea of distance learning and everything, it's just, it's just hard. So I guess I agree with the idea of finding your tribe, as they say, both personally and professionally, because you, I mean, especially now, we really do need it in terms of support because very few of us can just do it, you know, on our own, regardless of what we think we're supposed to do. Yeah, it's very insightful. Um, I, I think, the next question is around uh, career pivots. So both Vanessa and Subarna, you have had major pivots and for most people, uh, career pivots are extremely daunting. So what was your process for deciding when to pivot? And more importantly, how do you identify what new and meaningful problems to pursue? Um, I can I can start. So I, I went through a fairly deliberate process. I could see that. So the, the reason I pivoted at all was I was I was a pianist and I I taught piano at a private school and I was also their staff accompanist. So I had about 40 students there plus the staff accompanying. And then I had at home, I had about 15 students um, just that I taught privately. And then I did musical theater direction. So I had, uh, you know, I had booked shows fairly, fairly regularly throughout the year and they had a six week run and those Typically, they would have rehearsals Thursday through Sunday from eight till midnight. And then when they were doing their, for that would be for four weeks. And then for another two or three weeks, they'd have performances that would be Thursday through Sunday. So there'd be a Thursday performance, a Thursday rehearsal, a Friday performance, two performances on Saturday and one on Sunday. So that's a typical community musical theater run. And then I was also in a trio and we played uh, concerts here and there. And then I also did background music for, um, uh, you know, weddings, and funerals, et cetera, and parties. And all of that, you know, I was essentially working from seven in the morning until midnight every night, um, except on Fridays, I took the, the morning off on Friday. And then I had, you know, a little bit of time on Saturday and a little bit of time on Sunday. I was off of, off of work on Sunday night. And that all added up to about $20,000 a year. And that was fine. Like, I, I actually don't have a lot of requirements myself in terms of you know, I'm not acquisitive in terms of, of that kind of thing. But as soon as I had a son, I realized I couldn't afford for him to have piano lessons. I couldn't afford for him to play soccer. I couldn't afford for him to, you know, to do basketball at the community center. And it, um, I was having trouble making my rent even on that kind of money. And, and so I really had to do something different. And so I went through a very deliberate process of, you know, I like to learn things. So I thought about journalism would be great. Um, and then I realized that journalism also pays about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a year, and so I would have student loans on top of all this. So I thought, no, that's not going to work. So I looked at law because my grandfather was a labor lawyer, and my my dad does domestic law, and I thought this would be great. I really, I would love to do civil rights law or labor law like that would really motivate me because I, I feel strongly about those things. And so I called the University of Denver uh, Law School, and I was I am so thankful for this conversation. I asked. The, um, the operator, the receptionist at the law school to send me a, a, a pamphlet because I wanted to become a lawyer. And she said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. But just so you know that you're, you're going to leave law school with more than $100,000 in student loan debt. And I said, wow, okay. And <laughs> that's a lot of student loan debt. And she said, um, yeah, what kind of law do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd like to do civil rights law. And she's like, yeah, yeah, you'll make about $18,000, $20,000 a year. And I was like, I just couldn't, I just could not take on that kind of debt for the same um, thing that I was doing. And so I was, 
I was actually talking about this with a friend of mine on AOL Messenger, actually, because AOL was a thing at the time. And he, um, he was a person who owned a software company that he had started. It was a, a legal search, uh, like patent search type of thing. And I was chatting with him and, and the, the magic of it kind of struck me that I was essentially typing in a fancy typewriter and those messages could go anywhere in the world in an instant and that person could respond to me and and this you know was this great unifier of the entire globe it would allow me to communicate with people that i might never see in real life and it, in an instant and it was like magic and that struck me as really fascinating and and so i i decided to do that also it paid well enough that i could justify the student loans to go back and do that as a second career and so i figured it'd just be a day job and then i took an internship at AT&T Labs, and I worked with um, Srinivas Bangalore, who was working on machine translation, and it was completely inspiring because at that moment I realized that the computer isn't, it's, I mean, it itself is interesting as a machine, but what's really great about the computer is that you can use it as a tool to understand people. And so we could use, you know, machine translation is really all about drawing a parallel between the way one culture thinks about something and the way another culture thinks about something. And that's amazing. And so at that point, I decided I wanted to do research. And that's how I made the decision to go into computer science. And I've never looked back. It's been a great decision. Wow. Um, I'm not sure if I can back up that story. <laughs> My pivot was uh, probably kind of a little more mundane, but it was definitely deliberate. Uh, so for me, it was more influenced by kind of wanting to work on more interdisciplinary problems, kind of more real world kind of problems. Uh, so I had started out in an area called chip design automation, where you're basically working on algorithms for automating semiconductor chip design. Um, that, that's what my PhD was in. Uh, but about you know six or seven years in, I was getting a little bored of the work. Essentially, what had happened was the field was quite mature. So the problems had already been defined in some sense. And um, all we could do was develop better algorithms, maybe, but there wasn't a lot of freedom in doing much. Or the impact of what you did wasn't as high, I felt. So I started looking around, thinking about what to do, and somehow in that, that you know, in my friend, group of friends, like professional friends, we were talking about biology a lot. Um, and so at some point, um, I think I read this book by Francis Collins on kind of precision medicine, the promise of it, the fact that you could, like, you know, not all drugs work for all, pay, all people and you, you had to tailor treatments to different people. So that, it just seemed really exciting. Uh, there was lots of advances in genomics itself that were quite exciting. So uh, then, you know, I, start, I started the process again, very deliberately. So initially I tried to actually convince my, my boss at Synopsys that, that he let me do some research on that, which of course didn't fly. <laughs> and then finally, you know, I was like, okay, I have to leave the company, but where do I go? So I, I started talking to anybody who would talk to me. Like, I, I don't know how many hundreds of emails and, um, I sent out requesting to have a conversation with people. Um, ultimately, like these were like friends, friends of friends, like anybody basically. And um, I was open to both industry and academia, whatever, wherever I could find a place where I could work on this. So eventually um, I was connected to a professor at Stanford to my PhD advisor basically. Um, and he had just won a grant. He himself had made the transition a few years back. So I felt he would kind of be a little more um, kind of friendly about my own, my transition, because, you know, it's, it's a little um, kind, of my, kind of hard to go into a completely new field where you have no background. Um, and so this, you know, so I started there. It was a, it was a, it was actually the opposite change from Vanessa. I went from a well-paying job to a barely paying job. <laughs> and it I mean, all my friends thought I'd lost my mind, but my, luckily again, I have a supportive spouse who indulges me, I guess. And he's like, go for it, do what you want. And it was hard, uh, but it was an amazing experience because I, I was like reading you know, papers in biology and things that I didn't even know how to read those papers when I started. Um, like the, the even the kind of the culture there is very different from in, from like the culture in computer science. So kind of working around that culture. So it, it was um, it was a big change, but I loved it. 
Um, I also grew a lot in the process. I was doing very different kinds of things uh, because I was in academia. I was learning how to write grants, learning how to deal with rejection multiple times, picking yourself up and kind of trying again. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, um, I would say, uh, you know, to do a pivot, yes, you have to be deliberate. You, you, you want to go from a place, from one place to another place that you're more passionate about. But ultimately, I think it, it's actually, it, it's a huge confidence builder if you can pull it off. Like you, at, at, today, I'm at a point where I feel I can work on any problem domain just because I was able to make one big transition, basically. So, yeah, I, I guess change is scary for all of us, but it's super cool that you both were able to pull it off. Um, Maybe we can switch gears a little bit. And in this climate, we cannot avoid talking about COVID. And all of you work on a wide range of interdisciplinary set of problems. Could you talk a little bit about how you're applying AI and data science um, to problems in specifically related to COVID or related problems? And what have been some of the challenges so far? I can start. So. Um... So we started off with something kind of traditional, which was to uh, help some uh, colleagues at the uh, hospital in Grenoble to uh, search for information, gather scientific articles, you know, gather, also organize um, information around the uh, different trials and tests that were being uh, made and make them searchable. Uh, but then very quickly we realized one of the things that was uh, really lacking was to gather information about how people were living the, I mean, what was their experience during the lockdown? And, um, and there was absolutely no information about, you know, how people, you know, managed, you know, anything like their everyday life, their family life, uh, their relationship to, uh, to work and, so um, we started this thing that was, you know, really highly experimental and that's really um, uh, growing into something quite big, which was to simply, you know, uh, put together a, an infrastructure, um, a platform where people could uh, uh, simply share their experience. And uh, we didn't want it to be fully just you know, letting people to write free text because then, you know, we all know that um, dealing with free text is difficult afterward. So, uh, so this is a, a sort of a group of people who are, uh, there's there are people who are uh, computer scientists who, you know, I'm, I'm part of them and we, we, we developed this plugin that simply, you know, it, it would pop up questionnaires that are, you know, quite, you know, detailed and organized. Um, and then these questionnaires were designed by colleagues who are psychologists and um, behavioral economists uh, to, you know, ask, you know, just mundane questions, you know, about things that you're doing on a daily basis or how you felt about, you know, some new announcement about numbers, you know, people infected and, um, um, and also we realized we needed uh, people who were uh, experts in, um, you know, uh, gathering personal information, so basically law, uh, to kind of, you know, help us, you know, put that into uh, the right context and in particular GDPR context. And um, this really rapidly, pretty much, you know, like all the information about how people lived um, you know, what was their experience. And what I found uh, really um, both challenging and exciting was to, um, even though everyone knew what we were trying to do, which was basically just collect data and information about how people lived, you know, are living this period and how their experience was, um, you know, there was the, uh, of course, the underlying scientific question, you know, of, you know, what are we going to be doing with this data and what, you know, what it meant to us in different disciplines. And it was really hard initially to talk to each other because whenever we, you know, uh, used some terms or tried to just express, you know, what a questionnaire meant, what a question was, what a backend to store this information was, um, what were really the uh, legal context, or, you know, within which this was put. Um, we felt like we just couldn't speak the same language. So one thing that really helped us 
was to simply you know put together a lexicon where I was you know for instance as a computer scientist attempting to define terms and my understanding of terms that were used by behavioral economists or psychologists or law professionals and I felt that this was really a great experience just to kind of learn to talk to each other like on common grounds and we're still using this lexicon among ourselves and when we communicate to the public and to others we sound very consistent and sound like we are really talking about the same thing but it really took us a long time. yeah <laughs> and it's still work in progress yeah um elaine or karen do you want to talk about the health and economy aspects a little bit yeah i can talk i can talk a little bit um so the work that I've been doing has been around data collection, but not so much raw data collection. So we have a, a GitHub repo that has focused on trying to bring data that's being reported from African countries into one place. And the idea is not just to look at how many people are sick or how many people have recovered, but to actually have individual information. So for every single person who has been reported as infected, what is your demographic? Where are they located in the country? Um, what is their current status? Are they in the hospital? Are they recovered? And it's been quite challenging. So there are countries that have provided a lot more information. And then there are countries that have basically stopped to just reporting how many people are sick, how many people have died, and how many people have recovered. And you can understand that because of the pandemic, people are trying to figure out resource allocation and whether this is something that they should be spending more time on or if it's just sufficient to report cases. But if we can actually have information on individuals, then we can begin to understand the epidemiology of the disease in, in different countries and how that differs from what we're seeing in Western countries. So that's one thing I've been doing. Um, I've also collaborated with people to look at inequalities around things like social distancing. So if we look at how people have been social distancing during this pandemic, do we have differences across um, income groups, for example? Do people from lower income groups have less opportunity to social distance because they have essential jobs? So they're usually out there interacting with people also more likely to get infected. Um, so we've been doing this in the US, but also starting to look at South Africa as well. Uh, I can I can jump in and share a little bit from an economist perspective. One of the things that we've been looking at a lot is how to think about helping, I mean, literally the tens and tens of millions of people who've become unemployed as a result of the pandemic. How do we help them navigate the career transitions that they're going to have to make? So by that, I mean, um, we're looking at our data and trying to help people think about, well, if you've been put out of work or you've been furloughed, this might be a great time to skill yourself. So we've created something we almost call like a skill genome that lets you look at clusters of skills that align to a career path or a career ladder. And you can examine if you have some subset of those skills, what are say some jobs that also draw from that same pool of skills. And maybe you only need one additional skill and suddenly you're on a different career path. And possibly it's a career path that's more growing, more in demand. Um, so the idea is to kind of understand what skills do you need and maybe what kind of career paths could you relatively easily transition to that don't require, you know, $80,000 worth of debt or four years of school or something and get yourself onto a more sustainable um, career path. Um, given that so many people, and we know it's 30 million people in the U.S., but that's just the U.S., there are many, many people who are furloughed, waiting at home to be called back to work in other countries around the globe. How do we help them navigate those career transitions? So we've been using our data to try to look back and say what historically has been good careers and how do we help people make that transition? So Barna, do you also want to talk a little bit about the genome work that you're doing? Uh, right, yeah. Um, so I'm personally not involved in the COVID efforts of my company, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, like um, at 23andMe, uh, one of the things we are trying to do is to understand uh, what are the genetic susceptibility factors or the risk factors for either getting COVID or if you have COVID to get severe COVID, which, is, which are the cases that um, require hospitalization. And uh, there are also actually efforts not outside 23andMe. There is a host genetics COVID initiative that's also 
kind of trying to collect data. Um, and so obviously, you know, like there was no data for this problem pre <laughs> January of 2020, right? And so data collection has been a huge effort. So once I think uh, the problem, once we feel, like realized the magnitude of the problem around March, um, 23 and me, we put out a survey to try and under, kind of collect data from our subscriber base of, to see if there were people who had been infected with COVID and, you know, like if they had severe COVID, et cetera. But initially the data wasn't as forthcoming. We couldn't really get any signal, but um, I think eventually we are beginning to see some signals. I think we've published about it and it's similar to what other people are seeing in their cohorts as well. Uh, but yeah, this is an ongoing challenge like to try and get more data. Um, and then more broadly in genomics, there is a lot of interesting work now actually to try and understand uh, how to develop new therapies for, uh, for COVID. Um, and one way you would do it is you would try to find like, you know, like genes, like human genes that actually interact with the viral proteins. And the idea is if you can find those genes and somehow you can target those genes with drugs, you can kind of reduce the, you know, you can reduce the ability of the virus to infect human cells. Um, and a lot of that work, you know, it uses say, you know, mining existing literature or, you know, de designing chemical assays that would measure protein protein interactions and understanding the data. So there's a lot of super interesting work in that area as well in this field. Yeah. It's very interesting. So also one, once the pandemic hit, uh, pretty much every new site, every website started speaking about COVID. But at the same time, we also observed a rise in misinformation propagating everywhere. So as AI scientists and a data community, uh, what could we have done to sort of curb misinformation and help people get accurate information? Um, who wants to, Vanessa? Well, I can say, so I'm, I'm leading a team at Amazon. Um, and so I, I would have to say that, you know, Amazon is always on the lookout for um, products that are fraudulent. So, um, you know, they're, obviously we don't want people using Amazon and purchasing a product that's fraudulent and then, you know, it's just problematic. But that, that problem became um, even, more, even more of a problem when COVID came up because of course now we have and there's two, two big ones. One is that people are making overclaims like this will prevent COVID or cure COVID, which is just blatantly false. And then the other is the price gouging aspect where things that people actually need have become less available and very, very expensive. And so, you know, really finding ways to automatically detect that um, because of course, you know, if, if, if everybody trying to make an overclaim uh, is, is obvious about it, it would be very easy, but of course they disguise the language and they, they, you know, use every trick they can to, to prevent you from finding the product and, and still being able to sell to people. So that's been the, the big thing that we've been looking at. There's that. And then the other thing is that understanding that the supply chain is, is under stress because people are, um, you know, now people are having to order a lot more things online because the stores aren't open and so forth, that they, they needed to make sure that when people are ordering um, sort of mission critical items like protective gear or gloves or that type of thing that they that the company wants to prioritize uh, the ability of those things to get where they need and so then they ended up um, sort of making sure that that the the shipping that the products that you don't need are going to take longer so that the products that you do need can get there faster and so that figuring out the the right balance uh, in the supply chain I think is, is quite also quite a uh, an optimization problem that, that was is, you know, sort of primary on everyone's mind. Um, anybody else wants to add on to that? I can talk a little bit around misinformation and pandemics or epidemics in general, because the last few epidemics that we've had, we've had misinformation problems as well. So it's not, it's not completely new, but the volume, because this is a pandemic, it's so much more than what we've had in the past. So for example, during the Ebola pandemic, there was misinformation about treatments. So there were sites um, that were sharing information that if you drank salt water, you would recover from it. And the people actually drank it and died um, because they had other health conditions. So they had complications because of that. So we've been seeing misinformation about 
you know, how to prevent the coronavirus, how to treat it, how to, um, how it spreads. So all of that has been spreading. And so it's not completely new, but dealing with it is definitely been a challenge, I think, for public health officials. And I think WHO has tried to, to make as much effort as they can to control the spread of misinformation. But it always seems like there's something new popping up, like as soon as one is dealt with, there's something else that comes up. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so some of the recent events have brought in a sharp focus to longstanding questions about racial discrimination in the United States. And uh, today we have a lot of data about many things, be it law and order or about the rising COVID related deaths or job losses in the economy and all of it disproportionately affecting certain communities over others. So as AI scientists and leaders, what can we do to solve some of these challenges using probably AI and data science techniques? And uh, are we doing enough to build AI driven products to strengthen and foster a more inclusive and diverse communities? Um, who wants to start? I can start. So yeah, I mean, clearly gender differences exist both in employment patterns and in, in terms of conditions of employment. Um, so we, we actually uh, looked into it uh, a little bit. You know, uh, obviously, a lot need, needs to be done and there is data out there. And, you know, as data scientists, you know, uh, of course, we have the responsibility of uh, collecting that data and analyzing it. One thing we did recently was to um, go through data that we acquired from TaskRabbit, which is a, um, it's a mostly US-based online labor marketplace. Uh, it, it's also um, used by people in the UK. Uh, it, it basically, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's a, it moderates, you know, uh, job seekers and uh, job providers. Um, and we simply, you know, uh, for a number of large number of jobs, you know, we, um, we run a number of queries on the, on, the, on, the, on the website. And we found that, you know, women are twice unlikely to appear in the top 50 results of a job search, regardless of the job. Um, so, I mean, women are um, obviously among the most impacted, um, clearly, you know, uh, from this data, but also more generally because of, of COVID, they're, uh, they're the most impacted in their lives and livelihoods. Um, they're, you know, they're, they are impacted also because they're the caregivers and at home and in hospitals, at least they constitute the majority of them and, you know, almost regardless of the country or the continent. Um, and clearly we have a responsibility there. And, and, and I uh, recently read an article by uh, Melinda Gates, which was published in July, um, mid-July, I think, um, where she looked into, you know, all this question of, um, you know, uh, policies that are gender blind, meaning that they don't distinguish targets by sex, um, that are not necessarily gender neutral. Um, you know, they do not you know, affect men and women in the same way. And uh, one point she was making was that uh, COVID is gender blind, but not necessarily gender neutral. And she raised a number of uh, aspects that were affecting women. Uh, and in particular, of course, in, uh, in, 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 um, in the job market. So I think as, as scientists, we, we really need to develop tools to help you know, policymakers uh, first, you know, assess access to work, and that affects everybody, you know, women first, but also, uh, you know, everyone else, you know, men and um, different categories, different demographics. Um, so there was a recent study here in France um, that was called Le Testing, and uh, um, so basically it was mostly done by hand, you know, at least what we would call it as computer scientists by hand. It involved, you know, over 17,000 applicants, job applicants, who sent out, you know, resumes where they changed only one feature, um, which was, you know, personal information, basically, right? So either their name or gender or location, all of what we call protected attributes. 
Um, and that study revealed that people with a North African name uh, were 20 times less likely to be called in for an interview. Uh, so this kind of uh, you know, uh, assessments could be uh, made more transparent and more systemic uh, using you know, tools uh, that are able to process large, uh, large data sets. So I, I personally feel this is really a responsibility that uh, we have to take very seriously as scientists. Uh, you know, providing such tools uh, for large-scale data analysis and not just, you know, uh, you know uh, studies like the one that involved 17,000 applicants. Can I, can I jump in and add something just since we're on the topic of jobs really quickly? Um, we've also been looking a lot at the toll that the pandemic and the recession have taken on labor markets. And it's, it's pretty shocking. I mean, in some cases, people aren't even calling it a recession. They're calling it a she session because it's had such a huge impact on women. And to Sam's point about the fact that unemployment has risen, you know, as much as 15 points for Hispanic women just in two months since the beginning of the crisis. Um, the fact that women are not only on the front line in terms of losing their job in the service sector, but also they're the primary caregivers to children who suddenly aren't in school at all. I think we all know this. Um, and then finally, just looking at our own data, we're actually seeing that hiring since the recovery, which by the way, the recovery is actually beginning. It's just a kind of slightly jobless recovery. Since the recovery is beginning, we're actually seeing that women are being hired at a lower rate and men are actually being hired at a higher rate. So um, there are a lot of impacts that deal with race and gender that have been um, really important to call out. And I, I would just say what we have to do is we have to measure these things by these demographic points. Um, otherwise, we're going to miss them and in some aggregate think the recovery is happening, but it's not happening the same way for all people. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in on that point, um, but specifically related to even health products, right? Like, so with, even in genetics, like actually most of our databases are predominantly from European populations. And, uh, you know, we are realizing that like the kind of the predictive models we built may not work as well for other populations. So at least, you know, right now we are trying to uh, kind of make sure that the models we release, they have certain, a certain basic quality, they meet a certain basic quality requirement for other ethnicities. Uh, but there's a lot more work really to be done, both in terms of trying to collect the right, right amount of data for other populations, incentivizing the, it for other populations, um, and you know, also other sophisticated methods um, of combining data from different populations and uh, do, building models using that. So it's, yeah, I think we have a huge responsibility there really. I want to say that in addition to measuring things, in addition to really understanding the problem and making sure that our work is um, as universal as possible, I think the, the issue is in the AI community in general, people need to take it as their own personal responsibility to address this issue in their own work and in work that they observe and review. Like we cannot look aside and say that this is not our problem because we didn't write this paper. It is all of our problems and it is all of our responsibilities to do something about this and to and enforce that on the rest of our community because some large proportion of the AI community either is not concerned about this or they're working against it and we must change that this cannot be perpetuated we cannot use we cannot allow AI to 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 be used to further oppression of people and and I think um, and, you know it starts with us and it starts with us holding other people to account as well ourselves and other people to account and I was gonna say I think what comes with that is um you know in seeing you know all this talk about algorithmic bias and so I don't know if you guys have been um, following the like blow up over social media. And so then there's this discussion about, you know, we get it, you know, the data, you know, is biased and, you know, me looking at it and saying, okay, well, of course the algorithm is going to produce a certain thing because it's mimicking, you know, it's, so it's doing what it's supposed to do because it's learning, you know, correctly from the data. But then the issue becomes, you know, well, let's just not, and I think this is what you're saying, Vanessa, reduce it to a data problem, right? If it's a data problem, our big issue and challenge is figuring out how do you address that? And so I feel like 
we're being kind of hard um, on AI because we haven't even built, um, you know, taking care of this problem in reality, right? So that's why we're dealing it in the real world. So of course, we're putting our stuff onto the, um, the um, artificial intelligence and, you know, machine learning world because it's just learning the same, you know, for lack of a better word, crap that we're, we're doing, you know, in reality. So I really do feel like it's a big challenge. And since it's at the forefront now, um, we do need to start thinking about seriously um, this sort of problem. If we know it's an issue, then no, we cannot use AI models to be able to um, predict and um, establish or classify certain things because we have to be able to recognize that these problems exist, either on the front end with the data or on the back end of how you're going to use these models. And I, th I think the other thing is that a lot of the bias comes from places that if you're, if you're not looking for it, you won't notice. So um, for instance, in local search, you may be less inclined to recommend businesses in, in poor neighborhoods because they just have less foot traffic. And so if you're basing your model on foot traffic, of course, you're only going to recognize, recognize things in sort of upscale places um, because those people have cell phones and they're walking around. But I, I think that it's on us. So yes, the data is biased and the data is replicating what we have created in terms of our society, but we must, we must ask ourselves these questions and we must look for this problem and we must hold ourselves to account to do this because it won't be solved otherwise. And I think it's not just us, obviously on this call, we're all fairly aware. I think it's, uh, it's also holding other people to account. So when we review papers or when we look at the way that people conducted their experiments, you know, they may have beaten a leaderboard, but was, was it done in the right way? You know, is it ethical? What are the, limi what are the limitations of the work? And I think some things could be changed easily, like requiring that every paper that's published has a limitations section and addresses an ethical, the ethical considerations of their work. And having that be part of the review process and part of the paper publication process, that would be helpful. Yeah, it's very well said and very insightful. Um, I, I think before we open it up for Q&A, how about we do a quick rapid fire? Uh, so what would be the one piece of advice that you would all give to your younger self? Maybe we can start from, with Sehem. With me, okay. So um, my younger self, uh, yeah, it's hard, I mean, to give advice. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is to, um, uh, believe in oneself, you know, obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say something obvious, but it's important. I mean, it's something that um, uh, defines you, right? I mean, what are the things that you believe in? And, you know, what's the thing that you can control or so, right, that depend on you. And um, so that's something that uh, I think has to remain a constant. Um, then, you know, obviously, you know, depending on the people, I mean, that's a very personal thing, but um, uh, I've always, you know, looked up to certain people and, uh, you know, and that's something that uh, I guess this panel has uh, plays that role in a sense, right, to uh, uh, encourage, you know, uh, you know, younger, uh, you know, people who are aspiring, you know, to you know some careers or um so uh, you know at the time at least you know um many years ago when i was younger um i didn't have such events and i think you know organizing these kind of events is is very important i mean it may you know um, repeat things that we know but you know seeing people who uh we could look up to uh, eventually you know uh, is something that um uh, so, you know, I guess, you know, my younger self, you know, didn't have access to this, right? So, uh, uh, so um, I could only imagine myself, you know, um, uh, I guess younger today. <laughs> and uh, what I would tell myself today would be to, um, uh, what I just said, but, uh, but also, you know, something that uh, maybe a little delicate to say, but something that, um, uh, one needs to keep in mind, you know, as a woman, you know, um, it sometimes, you know, um, helps to think of oneself as a woman and sometimes, you know, doesn't. So uh, there are moments where you um, have to recognize the fact that, um, you know, uh, yes, there are just too few women in, uh, in computer science. I know I can speak for computer science because that's where I'm, 
uh, I, uh, I navigate. Um, and, uh, and, you know, while, you know, you can be strong and you can believe in yourself, uh, you also have to keep in mind the fact that um, you, you, there are not that many women who, uh, who are given a chance to uh, grow in uh, computer science. And uh, as a young woman, you do have a role to play uh, in that space. And, um, and that's something that, uh, uh, you know, you can, one, you know, as, as, as a, you know, young aspiring um, individual uh, can be seen as an opportunity rather than, you know, a blocking thing of, um, you know, thinking of oneself as someone who could, um, give an example right and show an example to younger generations so that's so yeah that's what i have to say Kalandra. um i guess i would say um to focus um more on the planning and honing of like your foundational set and not worry so much about the final outcome because um in actuality you know um in all likelihood what you end up doing is something that doesn't exist now so you want to be able to position yourself and prepare yourself for whatever the path and the change that you can, you know, follow that or accept that. And so um, to focus more on the foundational and enjoying that particular process than um, hanging up on, hey, this is what I want to do or this is where, where I want to be. But no. Um. Well, I, I guess, I mean, you know, yes, I mean, definitely kind of uh, believing in your own abilities, like often as women, uh, actually as, as young people, definitely, and, and definitely as young women, you're often told, you know, you should think of things a certain way. Um, I have gotten advice on everything, like unwanted advice, like how long should my maternity leave be? Like, how should I work once I have children? None of this was needed. So in some sense, you have to have, um, like believe in your abilities that you can do what you want to do. Uh, believe, uh, the one thing I would have, I wish I had done a little bit more was to craft a vision of myself. Um, I was, I think I was heavily influenced by my father who happened to be very technical and he, you know, he kind of nudged me along a certain path probably. Uh, but obviously there were things that he never had to deal with like work-life balance. Like I, he, his wife stayed at home, whereas, you know, I'm a working mother. Um, so I think, you know, I, I would encourage you to kind of uh, uh, think about like, what is it that you want to do? Craft that vision for yourself um, and keep naysayers at bay, but all, always reach out for people that support you because you do need that support to do whatever, whatever, you're, whatever we are trying to do. Um, and take risks really early on. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I talked to you about my career pivot. Um, I, that was in my hands, really. I could have done it like maybe five years earlier. Uh, I was scared to do it without kids. I eventually ended up doing it when I had two kids, <laughs> which is like not the thing that you want to necessarily do. So yeah, I mean, you know, take risks early on. Um, uh, fo yeah, focus on building foundational skills so you feel that you have the confidence to do the do that, and um, yeah, and craft a vision, which is very critical, I think. Vanessa. Um, so this is advice that, that I was given by um, Ricardo Baez de Yates, who was a boss of mine when I worked in Spain. Uh, the, the advice I would give is not to plan too far ahead, because you'll miss opportunities that come up if, you, if you're thinking of a certain path, and then you won't recognize the opportunity when it comes. That's it. Cut in. Yeah. Um, so my advice is don't wait until you're 100% confident or comfortable to go for something. It's okay to be uncomfortable to feel like you have it only 60 or 70%. Chances are the guys are in the same way. <laughs> so, so it's too late if you wait till you're 100% ready. Go for it when you're a little uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's okay to stretch. Elaine? Yeah, so mine is similar. Um, apply, apply for the job, apply for the internship, the fellowship. Take a chance, you might actually get it, but you would never get it if you never apply. And uh, the second one is get some rest. <laughs> that's something I'm yeah. learning. <laughs> get some rest, that's very well said. 
Um, this has been a, an extremely good learning opportunity for me and for all the audience, and it was a very insightful discussion. So I wanted to thank all of you for spending the hour discussing some of the most important issues and technical challenges and helping us learn a little bit more. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.